Hello and welcome to the first of this year's Formations events, a series of public events focused on global inequalities led by myself, Jenny Ramone, for Nottingham Trent University's Postcolonial Studies Centre in collaboration with Nottingham's Bonnington Gallery. Tonight, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Lila Kamali's History of Racism in Britain, a history of black people's presence in Britain from the Roman times to the present day, and a history of the racial violence, exclusion and oppression which has operated in Britain across those decades. We're very happy to be able to offer Formations events in 2021-22 after a very successful year of online events last year. You can watch many of those events on the YouTube channel. Please do subscribe to the Bonnington Gallery Formations YouTube channel where you can watch the events again and also find all of our future events. In November, we begin a segment titled Indigeneity, which includes author events, a conference, creative writing workshops, and a film screening of the award-winning Australian documentary film, In My Blood It Runs. Please do join us for those events and more throughout the year, where our segment themes will include events on the subject of love and on audio and visual art, literature, and ways of approaching the world. But tonight, we're delighted to welcome back one of our speakers from last year's series, Dr. Lila Kamali. Lila Kamali is a literary scholar with specialisms in African-American and Black British literature, diaspora, cultural memory and aesthetics. She's held research and lecturing roles at the African-American Policy Forum at the University of Liverpool, Goldsmith University of London and King's College London. Her book, The Cultural Memory of Africa in African American and Black British Fiction 1970 to 2000, which was published in 2016, was named boldly progressive and entirely original and provocative by Professor Michelle M. Wright and Professor Paul Gilroy, respectively. Her articles have been published in Callaloo, Obsidian and Atlantic Studies, and she has chapters on diaspora in the volume 21st Century Literary Fiction and on black queer poetry in With Fists Raised, a book published by Uni Liverpool University Press in um, 2021. She's currently working on two monographs, one on the work of John Edgar Wideman, whose work was the subject of her talk last year, the other on the inner life of blackness. Lila is also a yoga teacher, a body worker and a doula for the perinatal period. Lila will talk for about 50 minutes and she has lots of images, information and ideas to share with us in this wide ranging and important event. Please do feel free to send any questions that you have for Lila via email to formations at ntu.ac.uk or to type your question into the YouTube chat and I'll try to ask as many questions as possible at the end of the event. Please note that tonight's event includes live automated closed captioning which is generated automatically via Teams and there may be some mistakes. Before we begin, I also wanted to welcome online guests from Kwantlen Polytechnic University in British Columbia, Canada, who will be watching the event later on because of the time difference, and also to thank Jigsaw, um, Jigsaw 24 University Computer Equipment Suppliers, who've sponsored tonight's event. They didn't want to be thanked, but I want to say thank you because it's just great that we're reaching such a wide and diverse audience, which is what we've always aimed to do, and they wanted to sponsor this event just because they they want to sponsor interesting and important events like this one. So without any further delay, I'm delighted to welcome you all to tonight's event. Please join me and welcome Dr. Lila Kamali on the history of racism in Britain. Thank you so much, Jenny. I'm going to jump right in because this is a big topic and I've got much to get, many centuries to get through. <laughs> So this talk will give a history of black people's presence in Britain and of anti-black racism in Britain. My aim is to give you an overview of the history, as well as some of the tools to reflect on how you shape your anti-racist practice today. <laughs> 
So the history that I'll be covering in this lecture tonight divides the development of British racism and especially anti-black racism into four historical periods. I'm focusing on four specific periods. So the first period is the Roman era, era 27 before Common Era to the year 476. Second period I focus on is the Renaissance era, 15th to 16th century. Then we jump to the 18th century, which sees the height of the transatlantic slave trade. And finally, moving to more of the contemporary moment, the 20th to 21st century Windrush to today. Themes which will occur in this lecture, there'll be a few themes that, that might recur a few times. The first is the conflation of whiteness with Britishness and how that marks the possibility for an insider outsiderism or racism or xenophobia, the exclusion of others. Another theme is that the, right, that the fact that right, the writing of history is not neutral. History, as it is made, is politically inflected. It's never neutral. That's a basic understanding that I hope to get across in this talk. A third theme is the history of how black and brown people came to be seen as other and therefore discriminated against uh, throughout British history, but also that also links in with uh, European thought and, of course, um, US history as well. And finally, what, thinking through what is our responsibility to this history today in terms of knowledge, awareness and practice. So first of all, starting with the Roman era. Peter Fryer, in one of the uh, most long lasting and authoritative studies of uh, the history of Black Britain, his book Staying Power, says, Quote, there were Africans in Britain before the English came here. They were soldiers in the Roman Imperial Army that occupied the southern part of our island for three and a half centuries. Though the earliest attested date for this unit's presence here is 253 to 8, an African soldier is reputed to have reached Britain by about the year 210. Now, I have a question here, which is what does Fryer mean by before the English came here? And it seems like Peter Fryer as a historian is being a little bit cheeky here. He's referring to Roman Britain as preceding the Anglo-Saxon period of the fifth century, knowing that there's a general association of Englishness with uh, Anglo-Saxon identity, if you were going to be very um, reductive about Englishness. Uh, and so, you know, there's, there's things to be said about a very reductive idea of what English identity means. In fact, the closest thing to people who are absolutely native to Britain could be seen as the Celts in terms of an ethnic group. Britain is and always has been a nation of immigrants. And the majority of that immigra immigration has been from Northern Europe. So so-called anti-immigration rhetoric, if we're, if we're you know, talking about uh, rhetoric which is against the practice of immigration, uh, that really doesn't work because in England, Britain has always been uh, subject to the flows of people, peoples. So when we think about anti-immigration rhetoric, it's really just today another term for racism based on skin colour and or insiderism, outsiderism. So, so the identification of an insider group versus an outsider group. So Fryer really is troubling the idea there that whiteness is the principal indicator of Britishness. Further evidence of an African presence in Roman times comes in the form of uh, an individual known as Beachy Head Lady, whose bones were rediscovered in 2014, probably originally excavated in the 1950s. And since their rediscovery, the, but these bones have been carbon dated to prove uh, that this sub-Saharan African woman lived in Britain between the years 200 and 250 AD, 
Now, radioisotope analysis, this is the wonder of modern technologies of what can be tested from, from bones now, shows that this sub-Saharan African woman actually spent her childhood in southeast England. And that can be proven through the analysis of the bones showing the kinds of foods that, that she ate. So it's incredible. That's, you know, real concrete evidence of an African presence. And actually, you could argue a black British presence. She, you know, they don't know if, whether she was born here, but she was certainly spent her childhood here as far as long ago as 200 AD. David Dabidin, in his book, The Black Presence in English Literature, says that any scholarship relating to black people should not be divorced from consideration of contemporary racist realities. And the point that he's making there is that racialized bias affects what was recorded of the past, what was not recorded, what was preserved, what was not preserved, what is remembered today and what is not remembered today. So there's no such thing as a neutral historical lens. The uh, racialized bias, political bias, cultural bias absolutely influences what is read and preserved of history and what is not. We jump very swiftly next to the Renaissance era, the 15th to 16th century. And at this time, we can, we can start to see uh, some of the cultural threads that were running through Renaissance people's consciousness in order to show how deeply embedded racism uh, is today, how it finds some of its kind of mythology uh, built up in Renaissance times, and I think starts to explain some of the reasons why racism remains so hard to change, so hard to unpick. So remembering that uh, the slave trade itself began, or the transatlantic slave trade began in 1481, the Portuguese were the first people to uh, transport enslaved Africans across the Atlantic. Um, within that context, people, th there was a, a circulation of trades. So in Renaissance England, there were growing numbers of African peoples, uh, perhaps moving through uh, British society as a result of these, these trade routes, which were starting to be invigorated. So trumpeter John Blank here features as one of the earliest recorded black people in Britain after Roman times. And there his image is recorded in a tapestry. He came to the court of King Henry VII with Catherine of Aragon when she came to marry Henry VII's son, Henry VIII. John Blank is one of the earliest recorded black people in England after the Roman period. And it's, there's something quite, um, quite touching about seeing that image, you know, of, a, of one of the very few, uh, one of the few recorded images of a black person in British history of that period. So by the year 1562, Britain begins its large-scale transatlantic enslavement of African peoples. Uh, and it's interesting to me that in parallel with that entry into the transatlantic slave trade was the beginnings of a widespread mythology in Britain about African people. In Renaissance times, blackness is still a rarity um, and, you know, much popular, quite strange myth surrounded African people. So we're looking at a quotation from Peter Fryer's book that I referenced at the beginning. And uh, Fryer gives this quote, Fryer tells us about an ancient folklore from Pliny the Elder, who was a Roman author who lived far, far, be, far before Renaissance times, but whose uh, tales were very popular in Renaissance England in 1566. So this is Peter Fryer. He says, readers were told that some Ethiopians had no noses, others no upper lips or tongues, 
others again no mouths. The sabotai were eight feet tall. The toemphony were ruled by a dog. The Arimaspi had a single eye in the forehead. The Agriophagi lived on the flesh of panthers and lions. The Amprophagi on human flesh. There were people in Libya who had no names, nor did they ever dream. <laughs> so you can see there's a real kind of weirdness around uh, not actually knowing much of any significance about African people and how a mythology starts to be built up. Anu Kohonen, in a very interesting chapter called Washing the Ethiopian White, has this to say. To Renaissance readers and audiences, the horror evoked by blackness also had an extensive Christian background. Demonization of black skin was helped by a long and powerful Christian tradition of depicting demons and the devil himself as black. Sin was black, virtue was white. The familiar images of blackness were so powerful that the text could evoke them even without much actual description. So we're talking about the ways in which blackness was conceptualized back in Renaissance times. And even then, there was this sort of mysterious quality around why is blackness associated with sin? It's a quality which is then associated with uh, Christian mythology, but the roots of it are, are not all entirely clear. So for me, you know, coming way back to the contemporary present time, seeing how racism started in this almost mysterious way so long ago and where its roots couldn't even fully be discerned really helps to un helps me to understand how today, when we usually feel that we've made so much so-called progress, racism can just pop up out of nowhere so easily as if it's always been there. Anti-black racism is naturalized in our culture. And, you know, this one of the last very memorable moments of that was, of course, during that um, the responses to that penalty shootout in the, um, the UEFA football championship, which was a really um, unfortunate moment for this country. Back to the Renaissance, here we find one of the examples of Britain's relationship with its populations of colour being seen as a kind of continual historical pendulum. And a greater apparent acceptance or acknowledgement or of a larger presence of black people in, in Britain usually swings back to refusal, xenophobia, exclusion. And these are quote, quotations from none other than Queen Elizabeth I herself. So she made two specific statements in response to growing numbers of uh, African people appearing in Britain. First, the first one in 1596. Her Majesty, understanding that there are of late diverse blackamoors brought into this realm, of which kind of people there are already here too many. Her Majesty's pleasure, therefore, is that those kind of people should be sent forth of the land. In 1601, five years later, she said, Her Majesty is highly discontented to understand the great numbers of Nagars and Blackamoors, which, as she is informed, are crept into this realm, who are fostered and relieved, i.e. fed, here to the great annoyance of her own liege people. Now, you'll notice here some very familiar points Back then, you know, 500 years ago, being raised uh, around the question of immigration. These points still always recur around questions of immigration. Britain is overcrowded. There are not enough resources. They, the immigrant others, are too different. They will not assimilate. These are the kinds of points that Queen Elizabeth I was making. So remember that in 1492, Christopher Columbus had so-called discovered the Americas, and that particular incursion initiated an ongoing European contact with the Americas. So that started to build explorations, which led eventually to the extraordinary levels of trade, which, in, in, which initiated the industrial world. And so we move to the 18th century. <laughs> 
So this image represents what's often called the triangular trade or the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, this image kind of quite a simple representation of the way in which the trade was conducted. So African people were enslaved, uh, were kidnapped or sold uh, from the coast of Africa. Slaves were transported to the Americas. In the Americas, slaves were traded for sugar, tobacco and cotton. The sugar, tobacco and cotton was transported back to Europe and traded for textiles, rum, and manufactured goods, which were in demand in Africa, taken back to Africa, and those in turn were traded for enslaved peoples. And so the triangle goes on and on. The trade in, Af in African slaves had already begun then and moved to become more formalized in 1672 with the establishment of the Royal African Company. Britain carried at least 3.4 million African people to the Americas between then and 1807, when the abolition of slavery in Britain and its empire was passed. The trade did carry on for longer though, with the Portuguese carrying about 5 million people. The estimated total of people carried from Africa through the transatlantic slave trade is 12 million people. Now, a famous quotation from the novelist Salman Rushdie springs to mind when he says that the trouble with the British is that all their history happened overseas so that they don't know what it means. The majority of enslaved people worked on plantations in the US South and in the Caribbean. By the end of the 18th century, there were around a million slaves in the British Caribbean alone working about 3,000 hours a year uncompensated. This is 3,000 million hours per year of free labor producing sugar, coffee, and cotton. And so you can see very easily how that amount of uncompensated labor formed the foundation of the industrialized world. Slavery was an incredibly brutal system Enslaved people were valued only as a commodity and sickening violence was absolutely a routine part of the system. Institutionalized rape, the permanent separation of children from their parents was also a routine part of the trade. Masters and overseers fathering children as a matter of course and therefore enslaving their own children was a routine part of slavery. Now today, as we're doing this uh, anti-racist learning, there's an aspect of anti-racist work with, which is a kind of inner work. And uh, a number of the um, authorities in anti-racist education today really emphasize this, uh, this aspect of anti-racist work where we observe our own reactions. Uh, so Nova Reed's book, a very new book, The Good Ally, is a book I particularly like, actually, and, and is, I would recommend as a read for uh, uh, accompanying your own anti-racist journey. So racism is a centuries-old trauma which impacts us all. And just from, you know, hearing that little bit about the sheer scale uh, the sheer global scale of um, traumatic abuse inflicted on millions of people, the sheer brutality of the system, of which I've only covered a, a mere corner in what I've just said, this is a traumatic history. And a number of the anti-racist commentators who uh, write and speak on this topic today and, and the anti-racist work that is, is our responsibility to do, point to the fact that trauma is held intergenerationally. Research has, has now shown that. And trauma is held in the body. And so you're invited as you engage with this material and as you engage with thinking about the history of racism to notice your breath, notice your feelings, notice your bodily responses. 
perhaps do some journaling or personal writing after this lecture to help you to observe your responses. It's likely you will have strong responses and reactions to what you're learning and arguably it's our responsibility to work through those feelings so that we can be something like a good ally in anti-racist struggle. It's important to understand how the development of racialized thinking created the conditions which enabled transatlantic slavery to happen. And I think that Professor, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles puts this very, very clearly um, in when he was interviewed for uh, the BBC programme Britain's Forgotten Slave Owners. He says, the English arrive in the Caribbean already with a fully formed racist and racial view about other people, especially African peoples. But the market conditions have enabled an existing racial mentality and racist mentality to take root in economic and financial management. And so you build an economy that is reflecting your state of mind. So there's a very clear demonstration there in what Beckles says of having the economic uh, practices happening on one side and the cultural uh, sensibilities happening on the other side and how the two support one another. In parallel with the trade in, in African people and with the rise of an interest in occupying foreign lands to create the British Empire, was the development then of racialized thinking among Europeans, which justified enormous cruelty on the basis of ideas presented as science that claimed that black and brown people of the world were measurably less intelligent, felt less pain, cared less about their young than white European people. That, those kinds of mythologies were just part of um, the cultural system which enabled slavery to happen and enabled colonialism to happen as well. This field of thought is called scientific racism. It is entirely discredited today, but it still affects the medical treatment that black and brown people receive today. So powerful is the legacy of scientific racism. So one of the more shocking statistics in today is that black women in the UK today are four to five times more likely than white women to die during pregnancy or after childbirth. Brown women are twice as likely as white women to die. So showing clear legacies to uh, inequalities in the way that, um, that, that medical treatment is um, regarding uh, people of so-called different races. So scientific racism as a category can be said to describe a strand of European thinking which became increasingly influential from the 16th century to the 19th century. So a very long period of time, which also happens to coincide with, with the height of the transatlantic slave trade. Two of the proponents of uh, what we now call scientific racism were the, the German physicist Johann Blumenbach, who came up with a racial classification system. So it's the classifying of uh, human beings into these different racial groups, essentially, um, prior to you know, Blumenbach and one or two other thinkers, the idea of race hadn't really occurred. So there's you know, this, this real categorizing of people into what's, what's uh, seen as different races. Another proponent of um, this kind of thinking was the Dutch Petrus Kamper, who uh, specialized in a form of science, now we term it pseudoscience, not really a reputable form of science, known as craniometry. And craniometry was interested in the measuring of skulls and the precise measurement of jawline angles and uh, as you can see from this kind of visual representation, um, the measuring of European uh, bone structures as opposed to African and other 
um, so-called racist bone structures. And of course, these, this kind of obsessive measuring presented as a science was used to classify people into groups, which started to be known as races. And of course, that classifying of people into races was done in such a way, the story, the narrative of race was told in such a way as to place European man at the height of um, intelligence, the height of sensitivity, sensibility, the height of care and all other races, you know, in a, in a degraded position in, in relation to European man. So you can see how that kind of science and the way it gained traction really started to um, serve as very clear justification for uh, slavery and colonialism. By the time we come to the abolition of slavery, I'm afraid it was not primarily due to a crisis of conscience, but because slavery ceased to be so profitable. The humanitarian case was part of what gained popular support for abolition, but, but that humanitarian case was also a narrative which was engineered to support the political and economic case. Industrialization and machine manufacturing and farming had by this point made slavery itself less profitable. Slave rebellions were also an increasing threat to the order of things, with the Haitian Revolution, for instance, notably succeeding in 1804 with the founding of a new and independent republic. William Wilberforce, you will have heard that name, was a key person in the abolitionist struggle, but he was not the only one. Ab abolitionism itself was served by slave narratives, and slave narratives were uh, stories either written by or told to um, told to a scribe uh, in the words of formerly enslaved people. So three of the best known slave narratives are by Alauda Equiano, by Mary Prince and by Ignatius Sancho, all of whom had experience of life in Britain in the 18th century and who had also been enslaved people. Now, in order for slave narratives to help to gain the traction to end slavery, the narrators, the, the, the enslaved or formerly enslaved people themselves, always had to be shown to be good Christians. They always, their narrative always had to be framed as highly moral. They had to be well-spoken in you know, terms considered to be acceptable to English culture and cultured, and, and they, they were cultured in, in English manners, let's say. We see evidence when we look at these slave narratives that black anger could not be too out of control. We have instances, for, for example, in Ulauda Equiano's narrative, where he almost turns away from uh, instances of brutality that he's telling us about, telling us that you know he, he can't really uh, go into further details and that the emotion is very controlled at times. That was, in a sense, a political requirement of the slave narratives in order to appeal to powerful, a powerful white class to actually gain the traction to end slavery. Uh, black anger could not be too out of control. So being mindful today that there's a tradition to an expectation that black people behave in certain ways not to attract racial mistreatment. There is a history to the expectation that black people's anger in the face of all injustices will be controlled. In the early 19th century, the Industrial Revolution began to transform Britain. The British Empire expanded to include most of India, large parts of Africa, and many other territories throughout the world. Alongside the formal control that Britain exerted over its own colonies, its dominance of much of world trade meant that it effectively controlled the economies of many regions, such as Asia and Latin America. So moving to further to, towards our contemporary moment, the 20th to 21st century Windrush onwards. After the Second World War, the British government made an explicit call to subjects from its colonies to come to Britain to help to rebuild the motherland. 
On the 22nd of June 1948, the Empire Windrush steamed up the Thames to the Tilbury Dock in London. There had been a couple of previous ships coming from the Caribbean in this moment, but the Windrush became emblematic. The Windrush carried 1,027 passengers and two stowaways on a voyage from Jamaica to London. The new arrivals were the first wave in Britain's post-war drive to recruit labour from the Commonwealth to cover employment shortages in state-run services like the NHS and London Transport. This welcome that was extended to colonial subjects was supported by legislation. The 1948 British Nationality Act provided a definition of British citizenship for the very first time, and it did so in globally expansive terms. Under the Act of 1948, British-born and colonial-born people were, in legal terms, one and the same. Anyone born in Britain or in a British colonial territory became a citizen of the United Kingdom and colonies. All citizens of the United Kingdom and colonies were also British subjects. However, there were trials and tribulations for that Windrush generation, people coming from the Caribbean to Britain. And we have a very uh, telling testimonial, uh, one of many testimonials that are available to us today from the book, The Windrush, The Irresistible Rise of Multiracial Britain. And this is an individual named Cecil Holness. He says, so you come off and they put us at Hounslow Square at the hostel. And then we used to leave from South Kensington to Victoria and take the Orpington train. And then when we leave, Hounslow Square went to West Cromwell Road to live in Earl's Court. You move around a lot because people didn't give you a lot of time. In those days, it's either two or three of you in a room. In those days, as a black man, it's very hard to get a room. You wouldn't get one. They always put on the board, black N-words, not wanted here. So coming on the back of that, you know, increased uh, immigration to Britain, which was actually invited by the British government, are increasing racial tensions. And 1958 saw race riots, anti-black riots, whipped up by media sensationalism. Attacks by Teddy Boys and Os Oswald Mosley's White Defence League uh, on black communities. So these two images that I've selected here, I think, say something about what, what white violence looks like. The, the image on the left shows how uh, re really a, a fascist organization, the White Defense League, situates itself as a site of control. And, and the site of control that it situates there is also a site of control over black people. The image on the right shows another form of control over black people. A, you know, a police officer holding someone by the neck. Uh, but the implication with that second image of uh, violence, the implication is that it's the black individual who is violent, who needs to be contained. And this is all part of the racist narrative, which, which has underpinned um, the history of racism in this country. So Racial tensions had escalated then to the point that in 1958 there was an attack by 400 whites on Caribbean people's homes in Notting Hill. The Notting Hill Carnival was started as a response to that crisis. Moving forward to 1968 and we see this uh, anti-immigration, this xenophobia escalating to uh, a fever pitch with, with Enoch Powell's famous speech, um, which is often called the Rivers of Blood speech. There's a YouTube link there. You can, you can hear the recording of the speech there at that link. Powell said, in this country, in 15 or 20 years time, the black man will have the whip hand over the white man. In a respectable street in Wolverhampton, a house was sold to a Negro. Now only one white, a woman, old age pensioner, lives there. This is her story. The immigrants moved in. With growing fear, she saw one house after another taken over. The quiet street became a place of noise and confusion. The telephone is her lifeline. Her family pay the bill and help her out as best they can. She is becoming afraid to go out. 
Windows are broken. She finds excreta pushed through her letterbox. When she goes to the shops, she is followed by children, charming, wide-grinning pickaninnies. They cannot speak English, but one word they know, racialist, they chant. When the new race relations bill is passed, this woman is convinced she will go to prison. And is she so wrong? I begin to wonder. So Powell, following that speech, was forced to resign. It was not, you know, it was not accepted. It was seen as highly inflammatory. But the Commonwealth Immigrants Act of 1968 was passed as a direct result of his anti-black agitation. Now, this 1968 Act actually reversed some of the liberties that, that were afforded to uh, Commonwealth citizens 20 years earlier in 1948. This 1968 Act reduced the rights of citizens of the Commonwealth to migrate to the UK. It restricted the future right of entry previously enjoyed by citizens of the UK and colonies to those either born here or who had at least one parent or grandparent born here. So what was going on simultaneously around the world to create this, this culture of um, kind of paranoia around immigration? In the United States, you had the civil rights movement and the black power movement, highly visible black, black protest movements, which influenced black people in Britain. You had the decolonization of many African and Caribbean countries uh, happening in 1960. So as in the Elizabethan times that we discussed earlier, the greater visibility of black people um, and black people uh, claiming their rights as citizens globally in a way, provokes a reaction of exclusion in Britain. In 1979, campaigning for election, Margaret Thatcher seems to capitalize on this, this culture of xenophobia when she says, People are really rather afraid that this country might be rather swamped by people with a different culture. The British character has done so much for democracy, for law, and done so much throughout the world that if there is any fear that it might be swamped, people are going to react and be rather hostile to those coming in. And of course, her, she was successful at, at being elected at that time. So all throughout this period, 1966 to 81, uh, these simmering racial tensions were underpinned by what's, what was known as the Sus Laws, uh, which invo invoked, you know, an older law, the Vagrancy Act of 1824. In order to bring a prosecution under that act, police had to prove that the defendant had committed two acts, that they, that the first that they had, that they were established as a suspected person by acting suspiciously. The second, that they had an intent to commit an arrestable offence. So those are very kind of um, subjectively interpreted ideas that someone is suspicious or they had an intent to commit an offence. And so the, those sus laws are virtually a licence at this time for racial profiling, which specifically targeted black communities. The new crossfire in some ways is seen as setting a scene for a new Black Britain shaped around a consciousness of the injustice, injustices done against Black communities and the importance of community in resistance. In the early hours of the 18th of January 1981, a fire at a 16th birthday party on New Cross Road killed 13 young people. They were all Black, all aged between 15 and 20. A survivor took his own life a couple of years later. These were the days of a significant National Front presence in the area, and it's highly possible the fire was a result of a racist arson attack. Abusive letters were sent to victims' families who were treated harshly by both the police and the media. The scandal of the failure of the police or government to acknowledge or investigate the New Cross fire led to the Black People's Day of Action. People, black community rising up, coming together and making it known that this was unacceptable. Still today, though, there's been nothing much from government in terms of uh, an acknowledgement of the injustice that took place with the new crossfire. An inquest in 2004 was inconclusive on whether it was a racially motivated attack. 
a blue plaque has now been placed, was placed in 2011 on the house where the new crossfire took place, but not by any government body. This was placed by a non-profit community trust. Like the later botched investigation into teenager Stephen Lawrence's murder in 1993 and the shocking catalogue of apathy which led to the deaths of 72 people in the Grenfell Tower fire, this history of the New Cross fire bears witness to the lesser value which has been placed historically upon black life in Britain in a system which initially was enabled by scientific racism and which upheld the logics of slavery and colonialism. Moving closer and forward towards our current era, now the 2012's, um, 2012 Olympic ceremony, opening ceremony, was quite a moment, which re-enshrined re this convenient British habit, of, first of all, of forgetting any non-white presence or contribution to Britain prior to 1948, the Windrush moment, and secondly, to uh, decide that it's a moment uh, that's convenient to celebrate uh, the contributions of black and brown peoples to Britain. In the same moment that the incredible achievements of Mo Farah and other British, people, British athletes of colour was absorbed into national celebrations, we later find out that, you know, the Windrush what, what ended up emerging as the Windrush scandal was going on. There's a cherry picking going on in terms of the way Britain treats its black and brown communities. The one moment uh, black people are absorbed into a sense of British pride when, when that moment is convenient and at, an, at another time uh, black people are shown to stay in their place. Windrush scandal began to surface in 2017 after it emerged that hundreds of Commonwealth citizens, many, who, many of whom were from the Windrush generation, had been wrongly detained, deported and denied legal rights. So this was going on, this, uh, this crisis of paperwork, essentially, had been going on behind the scenes, even in that 2012 Olympics moment of celebrating blackness at the heart of Britishness. This is the kind of um, irony, hypocrisy that uh, characterises racism in Britain. So in terms of our anti-racist action and learning, you know, having learnt this bit about uh, the history of racism in Britain, we have some questions about what can we do? What, what is our role? What is our responsibility to this history today? Now, I've been reading around, you know, a, a few of the popular anti-racist books and ideas, uh, which are really, really very current today. And I've come up with a few categories which, which seem of most importance in anti-racist struggle. So the first of these is self-inquiry for white and mixed people. A number of anti-racist books um, are, you know, widely available on the, on the market um, to guide you with your self-inquiry. So these are some of those books uh, which really foreground the practice of self-inquiry, uh, looking at ourselves specifically kind of guided for uh, white and mixed people um, to be thinking about their anti-racist journey. Second category, money. Recognise that anti-racism uh, anti -racism itself must be seen as anti-capitalist and anti-patriarchy and beca behave accordingly in business and investments. So move piece by piece towards a financial picture that does not exploit people of colour globally. Now that's much, much easier said than done <laughs> to, <laughs> you know, completely shift and uh, change the system of capitalism. But we have to recognise that capitalism you know, as this history we've, we've been through this evening, capitalism was built on the blood of black and brown peoples, and it continues to be built upon 
people of color globally. And so, you know, whether we're thinking about where we put our money as individuals or whether we are thinking about uh, our role in our businesses, in our companies, in our institutions, we cannot ignore the, uh, the importance of where money flows to and the relationship that money has in relation in, in the perspective of racism on the one hand or anti-racist practice on the other hand. The third category to think about in terms of anti-racist action is the creation of safe spaces and the benefit of safe spaces for black people. Uh, safe spaces are not necessarily segregated spaces, but they will be black centered spaces. Now, I've had questions in my mind around this question of safe spaces, you know, in in my kind of um, my most intuitive uh, way of approaching uh, race relations is, you know, why can't we all just get along? <laughs> I tend to come from that perspective. But as I've read up on the benefit of safe spaces for black people uh, within educational institutions and different kinds of institutions, uh, I've understood the importance of um, those kinds of safe spaces for black people, simply because white supremacy um, and all the, the term white supremacy doesn't just mean Ku Klux Klan, it just means um, whiteness as a real dominant, dominant factor in our society. White supremacy tends to encroach on everything. And so uh, safe spaces for black people, um, which do, need not be exclusionary, but will be black focused, um, is an important part of anti-racist work. Reading and engaging with the arts, investing in and supporting black arts and culture as anti-racist action. I would urge you to read black literature and view black art. That's partly because I'm a literary scholar, <laughs> so I'm biased, but partly also because when you read, you empathize. When you engage with the arts, you empathize. And so the more world, the more different worldviews you engage with in terms of the arts, the more you will build your empathic mus musculature in a way, you will learn to empathize with people who are different from you. Of course, vote anti-racist. <laughs> Don't vote for anyone who, you know, if, if you're committed to anti-racist action, then where you, where you put your vote is important. And also support the next generation of activists and educators to make meaningful change. So how how do we hope for the politicians of tomorrow to come through the systems that we currently have to be able to really uh, enforce anti-racist action in our society? That's something to think through. And my final one, again, as a, as a bit of a reader and a literary scholar, is to dream anti-racist. I believe that... Um, you know, our imaginative worlds are very significant in terms of creating and envisioning what a better world looks like through our own artistic and spiritual practice. So even, you know, working this into creative practices, but also into meditative work, I, I think can form a significant part of anti-racist struggle. So those were the resources, the anti-racist books. There are some further resources here um, and I think uh, Josh can probably copy those links into the chat. Um, just a few resources that I found interesting. The White Privilege Checklist, which was um, conceived of a few decades ago by, by a, a white scholar, uh, but serves as a thought-provoking starting point in terms of thinking about what white privilege actually is. And, and how it's different to move around the world as a white person to, to being of another colour. That's the second resource is white supremacy in the workplace, what that looks like. And again, some ideas to chew on. Some of it is provocative, some of it you might disagree with, but you know, being provoked, being asked to, to reassess some of your existing opinions, that is part of anti-racist work, that is important work. And finally, there's a, a Smithsonian Museum resource on community building, what anti-racist community can look like. That's that third link. Another resource which I don't have a link to, but it's an article which I found very useful in terms of thinking about safe spaces for, uh, for black students. Um, 
and that's that article by Deanna M. Blackwell. Um, so that's it, and I'm I'm done here. <laughs> um, you can, if you have any further questions or anything you'd like to discuss with me after this lecture, you can reach me via my website. There's a contact form on there. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lila. That's been a fascinating and really engaging talk, and we've had loads and loads of comments, discussion and debate in the chat, which is wonderful. Um, and perhaps people who have been having these conversations in the chat might want to um, look back to the beginning of your talk where you offered people kind of strategies for reflecting on the things that you're talking about because it looks like there has been some heated debate and discussion which is wonderful all of it really positive with people trying to find their own ways around the issues that you're raising their own ways to um, confront racist history in Britain and to deal with it and to move through and beyond it. So it's been really lovely to see all of that activity in there. Mm -hmm. And I've probably only got time to ask you maybe three or four of the many questions that we have, but we'll see how, how many we can get through. I thought I'd actually start with a, a practical, uh, factual question, which has been asked by um, Kwaku, um, uh, who's emailed as well as posting the question on the chat. So obviously um, this person really wants to know the answer to this question. So hopefully you can give this um, answer. Uh, they would like to know when the British government made the explicit call to create the Nationality Act um, in 1948, which um, enabled um, colonial citizens to have those supposedly same rights um, he wants to know whether this is before or after the Windrush. And of course, the Windrush was enabled by the Nationality Act. But I wonder yes. if you had any comments in general in response to that about the Windrush and its significance in British history and perhaps its distortion in British history, particularly because of the very long history of black presence in Britain that you've been talking about today. Yes, I mean, the Windrush in terms of the immigration of peoples from the Caribbean happened in, uh, it followed, that historical moment followed the call by the British government to people from the colonies to come to Britain because Britain was bombed and needed to be built up again. Um, so, you know, that that's what happened in the Windrush moment. Um, the, in terms of the distortion of the Windrush moment, and this is a very significant issue in uh, black, you know, the study of black British literature and the black British history, is the way in which the Windrush moment has been uh, misrepresented, you know, and I think this was really um, a clear purpose of my talk tonight was to show that, you know, there's a very, very, very much longer history to Britain's engagement with uh, populations of colour and uh, specifically black people's uh, presence in Britain was very much a thing prior to Windrush. Thank you. A question, well, two questions from Vinnie Tomlinson follow on quite nicely from this question. So first of all, um, Vinnie says that we should send this lecture to everybody from the National Trust who remain in denial. And of course, this is something that for us, um, our friend and colleague, Corinne Fowler, led this um, research project and she's had a lot of personal um, backlash as a result of that. And um, it's great that uh, this that people attending this event are in support of her work and her research. Um, but Vinnie also, um, with some of the other members of the chat, have been talking about history. And Vinnie says, uh, full history must be told, otherwise only the history that reinforces white supremacy will be told. And I just, I thought that was interesting because Vinnie's suggesting that we should tell a full history. And from post-colonial studies perspectives, we tend to try to tell peripheral histories or marginal histories. And from a Marxist perspective, we tend to try to tell history from below. But there are problems with telling histories in these ways, because perhaps if we're always telling histories from the periphery or from below or from the margins, then that seems to reinforce the expectation that there will be inequality between these histories and that there is some kind of a dominant history. 
but at the same time is it really possible to tell a full history? So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on how we might address history and how we might tell an equal history or a different kind of history and whether there are any approaches in either literary texts or in any of the recommended readings that you suggested that might help to answer that question about how we deal with history. Well, as I said, you know, my uh... I'm an idealist and I think that's why I study literature <laughs> and um, you know my my preferred way to see the world is that we can all just get along we can all talk to each other we can all listen to each other everyone gets a, a, a fair hearing um, and that I think that's what you know can happen when when um, you are studying literary texts and when you're studying a lot of literary texts, you get a sense of, wow, I'm really hearing a lot of voices here. Um, but, you know, I have to remember that, you know, I'm not living in the, in the centre of, you know, the, the cultural spectrum, um, which Britain is, which is, which is a, a white majority space. And, yeah, I have my ideals in terms of we should all be heard equally, everyone should have a, a space to speak in. But as I've researched this, as I've read more of the um, anti-racist books, you know, written by experts in what anti-racist practice is, and then when I read that article by Deanna Blackwell, which, which uh, gives a real expert view on what happens for, it's, it's, African-American focus, so what happens for African-American students on univers university campuses, talks about this constant recirculation of attention back to white people. That conversation is always refocused, especially on, on the subject of racism, conversation is always refocalized by white people's comfort. And because that inequality exists and that inequality is supported by research, that's why that particular question of who gets to speak has to be approached differently. To, to create an anti-racist struggle which is meaningful, you have to give, give the podium, like you say, history from below, you have to give the podium to people who don't normally have it in order to shift the centre of our vision in this country. I, I'm interested in how you um, kind of place yourself in your research field and we've had a number of questions that ask you to reflect on your own research practices and, and position. Michelle Selman has asked four questions, I think I'm only going to be able to choose two of them, but she asked firstly what what prompted you to choose this field to study and related to that what has been the personal cost of your published work I suppose the impact on you she also asks about how you deal with the trauma which is represented in the materials that you're looking at so how did you choose this as a field to conduct research within and how has it affected you personally perhaps in terms of reading traumatic material but also the responses that you get to your research or, or how you navigate a career perhaps? Mm. Um, what, people always ask me you know why, why did you choose to study black literature and I'm, I'm afraid I don't have a very sophisticated answer to that it's, it just grabbed me it just grabbed me <laughs> and you know I think I was I was drawn initially by some key African-American texts you know I remember reading Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man and reading Toni Morrison and just being absolutely floored by the power of the writing the power of the sensibility and the power of the experience that was being represented and then when I did my PhD studies um I came up with the question that I was very interested in which was what you know what's this kind of what's the relationship between African American identity and black British identity and how how does that work is that a two way street how does how does one kind of identity relate in it, how does it situate itself in relation to the other and that opened a whole can of worms for me um, and ended up being the subject of my PhD and then my book. Um, so yeah, absolutely, you know, um, I became absolutely immersed in this kind of topic. In terms of costs to me, I mean, it's, it's uh, 
it's always seen as a niche area. It has not been um, simple and straightforward for me to build an academic career. Um, I think that's partly because of the topics that I study, um, partly also because I'm a mother and I've been navigating motherhood alongside academia, perhaps partly also to do with my ethnicity and um, the way that my ethnicity is not easily pigeonholed and matched to um, the subject that, that I study. But one can speculate forever. But that's the nature of racism itself. And that's the nature of, of people who are disadvantaged at the hands of a racist system, is that no one ever hand delivers you a letter saying you've been racially discriminated against. <laughs> it doesn't happen like that. You, you get the opportunity, you know, many, many times in your life to guess. To, to apply guesswork, have I been discriminated against? That, that you know, that applies for racial and gender uh, and economic structures as well, I'd say. There are a number of comments and questions um, about the fact that um, black history isn't taught enough, um, that school doesn't teach enough black history, that people are learning about black history um, in from events like these for the mm. first time. Um, and one of our questions is from Bethan Evans, who asks about different ways of teaching history and whether there is um, kind of value in thinking about a non-linear version of history that can um, reveal black history in different ways. Um, she asks, do you think narrativizing history through alternative structures to linear ones can help uncover the ways in which racism continues in Britain in ways that have roots in the past but appear in ways specific to today's world and its socio-racial structures? Um, so I don't know if I can summarise that as you know are there different ways of approaching telling those stories and telling histories in different ways from the typical linear Method. Absolutely speaking my language in talking about non non-linearity of history making. And that that was that's that was a real central preoccupation of my book, uh, which focuses on what I ended up calling the cultural memory of Africa in African American and Black British fiction. And what I um, really the, the underpinning argument to my book is that uh, you have this cultural memory of Africa. And the cultural memory of Africa is, is quite a broad thing. It's like, how is Africa remembered? Um, Africa kind of very often situated in a, in a kind of uh, invoked or imagined past. And what I find uh, through my readings of four African-American novels and four black British novels in my book is that um, African American fiction tends to have tends to um, refer to a tradition of spirit possession, which is very important to African American arts and culture, um, and which also links in with um, Caribbean culture, the cultures of the of African peoples in the Americas in general, and and in contrast, in Black Britain, though you know I. It's not in any way to suggest that Black British culture doesn't, you know, is is sort of rootless or doesn't have histories, doesn't have traditions. It does, but Black Britain is so much more composed of extremely various uh, traditions from from the whole world um, that Black Britain, and especially you know, my book looks at the at the nineteen seventy to two thousand period that Black Britain is a space in contrast to Black America, Black Britain is a space of improvisation and um, discovering who you are in the now. And Stuart Hall, of course, spoke very powerfully about that. So that's the kind of, um, yeah, that's the kind of contrast that I draw in my book, which, which speaks to cultural memory and to historicizing in different ways through the imagination and through the arts. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And I hope that partly answers a question that we've had from Simon Smith, one of many questions, who asks um, whether you feel American racism is totally different from UK racism. So I think you're, you're 
start you started to answer that question. I don't know whether that's the question you can answer any more now in the limited time that we have available. Is it totally different? I think in some ways it is totally different. Um, just in terms of, you know, our institutions are very different in, in the United States to here. Um, the police as institutions are very different. Political um, organizing is very different. You know, there are some, there are some, you know, the more I get involved with working with US colleagues, for instance, the more I'm reminded that there are bigger cultural differences that we, that, than we sometimes realize. However, that's not to say that, um, you know, I mean, a very convenient fiction that Britain likes to carry is, oh, you know, racism and especially anti-black racism, that's the US's problem. That's over there. I mean, who took that problem to the US? It was Britain, <laughs> you know, it began with, it began with Britishness. And um, what's, what's been a feature of racism in this country has been, um, a, you know, an ability to, to make it a little more British, to make it a bit more brushed under the carpet, a bit more subtle. Uh, but it's there, nevertheless, it's there, it's absolutely present. And, you know, police violence against black people is a feature of life in Britain, just as it is a feature of life in America, even if it looks slightly different. Um, just to end then, um, Judy Richards has asked lots of really interesting questions and made lots of interesting comments. And one of the things that she mentions is that trade unions have had black workers forums for decades because black members insisted on the right to a space to discuss racism. And I think this connects really nicely to your comments, both on um, safe spaces to discuss these issues and safe spaces for black people, but also your um, insistence, which I think is really important and perhaps something for us to go away with, that it, all of this is bound up with the history of capitalism and that taking an anti-racist stance, stance is taking an anti-capitalist stance. And perhaps you might want to end there with a comment on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, uh, it's, I think it's really, really important not to divorce anti-racist work from uh, from a very holistic sense that racism and capitalism are bound together. And, um, you know, ultimately we are a global system. We can talk about racism in Britain, but we're all globally connected. And, um, you know, the vast majority of people globally are not white. <laughs> The vast majority of people globally are not white and the vast majority of people of colour, let me rephrase that, there are many people of colour globally who are exploited by capitalism. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just think it, it would be short sighted to say, you know, and some of these anti-racist books are about you know, look at your feelings, be in touch with when you experience racism, how does that feel in your body? And I think that's absolutely correct and right. And that's a really good place to start your anti-racist practice. But at the same time, do not lose sight that we're all in the grip of capitalism and the way it will exploit anyone it needs to exploit. And that definitely includes people of colour. Um, and so, yeah, safe spaces, um, I think, you know, come into that that recognition that w we're living in a system which is unsafe for many of us for various different reasons. Well, um, the, the chat is continuing on YouTube. There are so many comments, most of them applauding you and giving oh. you their thanks for what has been a really wonderful and um, eye-opening discussion and a really engaging conversation as well. So thank you so much for your time and uh, your um, attention and effort tonight. And um, we're really lucky to have you and very grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I will, I will, if I can, try and attend to any other any other questions that come up. Um, so maybe I can maybe I can respond to them on YouTube. But please do also send me a message via my website if you if you wish. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>